Uh, Jim Norton, a comedian, uh, Jersey boy, at Jim Norton is his uh, Twitter handle. Third consecutive uh, epic special, contextually inadequate. That uh, premieres tonight yeah. in, in Boston? Uh, well, I shot it in Boston, yeah. yeah. Okay, so it's in Boston at uh, 10 Eastern, so uh, is where he shot it. So you can watch this tonight on uh, Epics. Yeah, competing with the Bruce Jenner interview, which is great. That's kind of what you want to compete with, an American icon changing sexes. <laughs> would you? How would that interview go, though, if you have Bruce Jenner? We were talking about this, that people don't realize how big Bruce Jenner was back in the mid-70s. <laughs> yeah. He was one of the biggest names on the planet. And now, is there a sports element, in all seriousness, to Bruce Jenner... He's 60 years of age, I think, and now doing this. I don't know if there's a sports angle to it, but imagine if he did this around the time he won his gold medal. How big that story would be. I know, and how much more fun Wheaties would have been to eat (laughs) if I'm on the front. You know, the sports angle, the only angle is, he said, I think, that it was an overcompensation for, uh, you know, feeling like a girl in a boy's body. So that's why maybe that whole thing propelled him through being a sports figure. So maybe that would be the angle on it. But I, it is fascinating, I mean, you know, to, to watch this happen. Because usually, you know, people who are trans are much younger and they go through the surgery younger. Yeah. But to see an American iconic male athletic, the, you know, Olympian decathlon winner go through it. This is the only time this will happen. So it's always good to have your comedy special competing with that. <laughs> well, there'll be more laughs with you, I think, right? Yes. So you watch for the first hour. Bruce, you get turned on. Then you come to me and you relax a little bit. That's a- what, do you, what do people say when they see you? Uh, it depends on the type of humor they like. If they like it aggressive or they like what I do, they usually enjoy it because it's topical. And but I- if they see you on the street? Um, they're probably not very visually pleased. I mean, uh, they'll say hello. <laughs> I mean, but, but do they? Do you get uh, people who quote your lines back to you? Yeah, or the radio show, because I've done radio for so many years. It's usually radio stuff. Occasionally, it'll be stand-up, but it's usually something on the radio. Where they'll tell me, like, oh, you got me through some hard times, and they'll just describe some horrible cancer ordeal, and you're like, oh, good, I am appreciate you sharing that with me. You had, uh, what, Pacquiao on the show? We've had uh, May, uh, Mayweather and Pacquiao, but uh, Pacquiao didn't speak very good English. Um, and I tried to get him to sing Sometimes When We Touch, because he sang that in his <laughs> yeah, documentary, and it yeah. was really kind of creepy, but uh, he, he didn't want to play along at all. I think he thought I was making fun of him. What? Oh, okay. I can understand it. What about Floyd? Floyd was, you know, interesting, but he had a giant entourage with him, and uh, he didn't take his sunglasses off. It's like, it was like a, interviewing a rapper. You know, I think it was he was tired. He didn't want to do morning press. He wasn't bad, but, uh, you know, Tyson's one of my favorite guys to interview because he's so open. You know, there's nothing Mike Tyson will say, don't ask me about. You know, he'll talk about anything, and, you know, on radio, that's what you want. You know, yeah. Athletes a lot of times don't want to open up. Unless they're fighters. Fighters are usually, I guess they're used to talking smack to each other. But uh, baseball players I've always had a difficult time with and uh, football players. But you also, I think, you have to compete with an athlete. I find that they want to be competitive. So you have to earn their answer. And so I go after them and compete with them. Uh, and I actually, John McEnroe taught me that years ago where he said, you know, keep asking questions. He, he thought we were competing that I was trying to get something out of him and he wouldn't give it up until I asked the right question. So I viewed interviewing that way, that you have something, now it's my job to get it out of you whether you want to give it to me or not. What a great point that, this is how dumb I am. They come in as the alpha male and I would just curl up like the female (laughs) chimp and and lay on the ground and hope they didn't hurt me. That's exactly what it is because I think they look at it like it's a back and forth. And even when you're asking a question that doesn't have any bad intention, a lot of times they feel like you are trying to get something, even when you're not, when you're just asking. So they tend to, Terrell Owens was like that, very guarded. And yeah. I'm like, you know, we're not trying to be jerks. We're just asking you questions. I mean, how much do you think we can ask about the game? I want to know about your personal life. And they don't want to talk about it. Well, that's what we try to do differently on this show is I don't want to know uh, the X's and O's as much as I want to know what went behind the planning of the X's and O's. That I'm, I'm trying to get you to tell me a story. I'm trying to, to forget. Let's kind of suspend this uh, me against you on a radio show in an interview where we're, now we just talk. Right. And, and if you can get them to suspend that, then you have a chance with them because – Athletes are interviewed more than anybody when you think about yeah. it. You know, a musician you may not get a chance to talk to. An actor you may see once every six months. Uh, politicians aren't always there for you to ask questions. Athletes, LeBron James is in Boston. So before the game or after the game, if I'm a member of the media, I can talk to him. Right. Every athlete, you know, they're, they're available. A football player, after a game, before a game, 
you know, you're able to have access to them. So they've heard every question. The question is, how good are your questions to get a good answer out of them? Right. So they're very savvy. I think they also probably get irritated faster, which why there really is nothing better than like when, when managers or whatever. Do you ever see the Hal McCray clip when he's just flipping out and throwing things yes. all over the office? There's nothing better than a manager gone crazy <laughs> because they can't take the same question or the question that they don't want to be asked. But yeah, they are very good at being interviewed or they get testy very, very quickly. But like actors are the same thing. A lot of times they don't want like Robert Downey just walked off an interview. Yeah, I saw that. And I was disappointed in that. I'm like, because I maybe maybe I just read that reporter wrong. He looked a little creepy. But those are legit questions. I mean, how many times can you talk about Iron Man? He's not even a real person, you know. <laughs> Wait, it's a spoiler. Iron Man's not a real person. I apologize. I saw a preview, and I, I should not have said that. I, that slipped out. Okay. Tony Stark's a real person. Okay. Iron Man is not. Okay. I should have. I should have. I, you're right. That was incorrect of me to say. Uh, how much sports do you include in your act? Very little, um, unless I have a story. Like you know, I'll talk about that. Like Derek Jeter blew me off for a photo, uh, and instead of acting like a 35 year old man, I acted like a 14 year old wounded teenage girl, and I made fun of him in my book and in my act. Wow. But you know, unless something happens, uh, did it really bother you? Oh my God! Yeah. Oh, he, we took the photo. He actually wouldn't sign it. Oh, it killed me. Because, I, I, you know, as much as I've been doing stand-up for 25 years, I look at athletes and actors and musicians. Like, I'm, I'm like a hero worship person. You know, when I, when I meet uh, one of those guys, I'm very, very, like, okay, reverential. Okay, take me through this Jeter moment here. So you have a picture... We got a picture. I, I, I worked for XM. I'm on Opie and Anthony, and we were in Vegas, and he was one of the the, uh, the guests of the company. So we took a photo together, and then six months later, I went to a uh, a dinner that he has that foundation yeah, turn, turn, to. turn to, and uh, XM bought like a twenty five thousand dollar table. So I, I was such a creep. I really did. I stood outside the men's room just to get like pictures of all the Yankees. It really was awful. Um, no, it'd been creepier if you had gone in to the bathroom. If I thought that was an option, I would have. <laughs> Believe me, that was not out of integrity. That was just I knew they'd say no. You know, even Louisiana Lightning won't take one at the urinal. So I I I, uh, I asked Jeter to sign this photo of he and I, and uh, it was obviously not a picture for sale. I'm not some you know. It was me and him, and he turned me down three times. He's like, no, 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 I'm going to do somebody. And uh, I got really, really angry, and I kind of bashed him on the air, and I bashed him in my book. I kind of regret that, though, because it's like, you know what? Maybe he thought I was trying to get something for free, and it was a charity event, and I should have paid. Like, there might have been that angle. Yeah. Um, I, and he was doing a charity event, and I was there trying to get a picture signed. He wins in the eyes of humanity. He's helping sick kids, and selfish me is trying Do to get a photo. Do you think he'll put you in his next book? No. I think if he walked right in this room right now and I told that story, five minutes later, he'd see me and go, who are you? <laughs> no, I think I, I do not register in his life at all. You're the uh, the king of awkward moments. When we come back with uh, Jim Norton, we'll, we'll talk about some of these awkward moments. Sure. And, and Paulie, Paulie channels you, whether he knows it or not. He is the king of awkward moments. Oh, good. Yeah, Paulie's great at it. Contextually... I hate that word. I know. It's a tough one to say. It's a tough one to say. I mean, come on. You're a radio host. You know this. His uh, third consecutive epic special, Contextually Inadequate, from uh, the Somerville Theater in Boston premieres tonight at 10 p.m. Eastern. Joining us here in the Man Cave. You're the king of awkward moments. Paulie does this all the time. I'll come in, may have uh, new pants on, uh, maybe Fritzy has on cologne, and Paulie will inevitably say, like, yeah, what, what kind of clone you got on there? Or where'd you get those slacks? But you'll do this to perfect strangers. Yeah, I'll ask people. Donald Sutherland, I asked him about his cologne. I, I never mind. If a man smells good, I want to smell like him. It's not an attraction thing. And I think Suther Sutherland's a weird guy, but he actually gave me his bottle of cologne. <laughs> he did. He goes, here you are. And he gave it to me. And there was only a little bit left. And then his publicist asked for it back. And I was like, no, nah, I lost it. I was like, what are you just trying to give it to me on the air? If it's a gift, I'm keeping it. And I still have it. But what about the slacks thing, though? Can you ask somebody about their slacks? What, Paul? Well, years ago, I actually heard you and Opie and Anthony, and you're talking about the difference between saying someone's got a nice pair of jeans and you look good in those jeans is a completely different verbiage to talking to another guy. Yeah, oh, yeah, that is. A, because you're saying you look good to any man is never good. Because if it's from the back, he thinks you're creepy. If it's from the front, you're even more creepy. <laughs> Maybe from the side. If you're looking at his hip, you can go like, your hips look solid. That's not like considered kind of sexual and creepy. But no, you can't compliment a man in his jeans at all. I know you have a problem with hoarders. And if you see, you know, here the man cave, I'm, I'm a hoarder. You're a collector. There's a big difference. Oh, okay. Yeah, because you smell good. That's the difference between a hoarder and a collector. It's the smell. You smell clean. <laughs> I've taken a, a shower recently. Yeah, absolutely. And okay. your stuff is placed discreetly about. I mean, I'm the same as you. I collect. I get everything signed. I get boxing gloves signed. I don't know why. It's all signed to me. I'm never going to sell it. 
But yeah, hoarders are just kind of creepy and gross and they smell and they're narcissists and I don't put you in that category at and all. And they don't have good things that they hoard. No, they don't. This is toilet paper I got in 1975. I don't want to see your toilet paper. And they hoard their own bathroom stuff. They throw it on the steps. They're terrible people. I got a lot of hate mail when I did that bit on television too, you by did. the way. Oh, you don't understand. You know, Right now you're typing from a pile of garbage. I do understand. <laughs> Shut up. Do you have a friend who's a hoarder? I have a lot of friends with, with uh, mental problems. I wouldn't say I have one who's a particular hoarder. Um, I probably am the worst that I know, and maybe that's why I don't like it, because I see my potential in a hoarder to save junk. I had uh, Glenn Fry on uh, from the Eagles. Sure. Lead singer. Best documentary ever. It was awesome. But I said, you know, we always hear musicians have to go, you're sort of uh, gardening the the, the troubled life, you know, there has to be a darker side to you and you somehow find it and you know, you make it out and you write a song about it. Comedians do the same thing. Can you, like there are certain comedians, Jim Gaffigan's a happy guy. Yes. Brian Regan is a happy guy. Yeah. No, Regan's a happy guy on stage. I've talked to him on stage. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Re Regan's like Max Cady in Cape Fear. <laughs> <laughs> off stage, he's not, as, he's not as happy. Do you have to be, if I said you could be happy on stage or off stage, what would you take? Wow, great question. Um, I would probably take it off stage. I would rather be happy off stage because that's where I spend most of my time and that's where most of my misery comes is off stage. So yeah, I'd much rather be happy off stage and then cranky on stage as long as the crowd liked it. Can a guy be good looking and be a great comedian? I think you can be. I mean, Seinfeld, I wouldn't call him beautiful, but he's not he's hideous. He's got nice slacks. He certainly does. And, and he they're nice and neat good. and he looks good from the front and back <laughs> if you want the truth. Um, Brad Pitt can't be funny. No, because he has no need to. Being funny is a need. Like, you know, I didn't get asked to the party unless I tap dance like a clown. So if, you know, if you're good looking, that's why they have less of a personality because they don't need it. They get to sleep it's with like people. It's like the pretty girl. It's like the pretty girl. She's never as fun as, as the chick that's 40 pounds overweight and plays softball. Wink, wink. <laughs> you know, we, we, she's always more fun to be around and because she has a mullet and she's kind of had to work for any of the attention she's got. The pretty girl just is. But when you get on stage, can you get angrier on stage? Sometimes it depends on how the audience is responding. You know, I mean, I'm not one of those people that says there's never a bad crowd. There's a lot of bad crowds. So if the crowd is being rude or if they're not responding to something I really think they should respond to, um, I figure the plane's going down with all of us and uh, we're all going to need to shower when this is over. I make it miserable for everyone. What makes a great for a great crowd? A great crowd is just a crowd that doesn't judge whether they agree with it or not. Whether they, All I want to be judged on is do you think it's funny or don't you? That's it. Not whether you agree, not whether it's clean or whether it's dirty. Are you offended? None of that stuff matters to me. If it's funny, laugh. And if it's not funny, don't laugh. That's all I ask. When I watch Chris Rock, he, he seems like this panther on stage or yeah. a tiger. Like he's prowling. You can almost, as he's pacing back and forth like that. And, and he's attacking, not the crowd, he's attacking his jokes. Yeah. He's, he's got something to deliver, and he seems to build up this. And he's not that way off. No. Not, not stage. But when he gets on, he's different. And it's like athletes are this way, too. You can talk to an athlete, uh, Troy Palomalo. He sounds, he's one of the nicest guys. He's got a soft voice, very soft. He gets on field with the Steelers, and he's a Tasmanian devil. It, yet, I think you'd have to have that mix between what it's like on stage and off stage, you couldn't be that same guy. Is Andrew Dice Clay the same guy on as he is off? No. The, the, the funny, Dice is like, like a big mama's boy. Like he loves, he likes like big things of honey. He likes big things of candy and being babied. Me and Dice were working together in Vegas one time and I'm, I'm about to go on stage and we're just standing there and he looks at me and he goes, you get nervous when you go on? And I go, yeah, a little bit. How about you? And he goes, I'm terrified. <laughs> and that made me feel so much better about myself to hear this animal. Because he really is an animal on stage, just admitting that he's just Andrew and he's as scared as I am. Have we had a comedian? Ex well, okay, you had Eddie Murphy and Richard Pryor who had that kind of notoriety. Uh, because Dice was selling out the garden. Yes, he was. And before social media, he was doing it word of mouth. Yeah. Um, not that it's easy now, but it, there's a little more guys can do it because there's other ways to get famous. Would you rather do a big big uh, venue or small? Um, I like it. Well, I, I'm going to say small venue because that's really all I can sell. <laughs> so, so let me make it look like it's my choice as opposed to the public going, you're rejected, stupid. Um, you know, it's... Uh, I, I like a thousand seats. It's a great theater size. I mean... Uh, 
anything bigger than that. Louis did the garden three nights, and he and he said it's a it's a weird. He said it's the example he gave was it was like starting a truck engine. Like it takes a few seconds to get them going. You're not destroying immediately. Once they're going, they're going. But you have to kind of rev up into it. And I'm not as cool and collected as Louis on stage. And I would probably panic and tank the set. You have to have a certain mentality to do that. I I heard him he may have been on Howard Stern where Louis talked about going on stage and sort of made it up as he went along. So he 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 was going to have something to say for a stand-up routine, and he basically went up there and said, "Let me see if I can." just do something on the spot yeah that's great that's how i work out material at the comedy cellar you know i'm on the air in the morning whether we're talking about isis or we're talking about pop culture if anything sparks interest you go on stage that night and just kind of see where you want to go with it and a lot of times it bombs i mean a lot of times it just stinks 80 percent of what i think is going to be phenomenal i get up on stage and i'm like you have zero comedic talent you should get out of the business but the 20 percent that works works and that's the stuff that stays how do you know you're funny um it's just, it, it depends. On, I've always associated that kind of quality with myself because other people tell you. Other people tell you by like either laughing or even when they don't laugh, they don't look away ashamed. Like, you know that there's people in life who want to be funny and aren't, and they always try. But does it bother you when somebody says, oh, that's funny, but they don't laugh? No, because I think that's usually what a comedian will say. That's how you know a comedian's enjoying you. Uh, the, the, you'll say something hilarious, and they're like, that was very good. We just don't respond the same way. Um, so, no, I'm not offended. I would prefer to have that than them fake laughing. I hate fake laughter. Seton, give uh, Jim some... Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's better. My fake laugh is not good. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that sounds fake. Yeah, it really does. I'm not a good fake laugher. We had Seinfeld on at the Super Bowl in New York, and he sliced and diced us. He carved us up. Oh, did he really? Yeah, he, t he gave us a tutorial <laughs> on... He, he said... Uh, we did a skit, and he said it wasn't bad. And he said that was a compliment. Yeah, it is a compliment because a guy like Seinfeld, I don't know Jerry well, but I've known him enough over the years where he's uncomfortably honest. Like he just, he can't pretend he likes you if he doesn't like you. So I think the fact if Seinfeld doesn't spit on you, you're hitting a home run with Seinfeld. That's nice. Very yeah. nice. Uh, you're not big on sports talk radio, though, right? I've made fun of it in the past. Yeah. Uh, good sports talk radio, I like. But, you know, like, you know, Mike Francesa, the, how do you not like Mad Dog? Francesa irritates me, but Mad Dog I like. You I now like. You know, I have to say that because I'm here, but I yeah, do exactly. like you. But you're, you're a good broadcaster. Will you stab me in the back after you leave? Never. Never. Unless you bash me, then I would. Oh, Okay, I promise not to bash you. And I'll never stab you in the back. All right, I appreciate it. I would that. like us to be friends for a long time. But why, why is it you don't like Sports Talk Radio? Because I found that so many of the callers were irritating and they're calling up making the same awful point. You know, when we got kicked off the radio on Opie and Anthony, for t I couldn't listen to comedic stuff. So I was literally riding around just looking at <laughs> prostitutes every night listening to Joe Beningo on the fan. And I love Joe Beningo because he's a real sports guy. You know what I mean? The Jets! You know, he just can't contain how what, much he hates them when they lose. What turned you on more? Listening to Joe or driving around looking if at If the Jets him. lost, Joe did. If the Jets won, it was the young lady, let's pretend, on the corner. Um, and I, I just, some of the same callers make the same points over and over, and it just got to be awful. And the sound bites, a lot of times the athletes, the sound bites they give are just banal. And So what do you think? Yeah, I got to take it one game at a time, and, uh, you know, we just got to uh, look for the next game and not look beyond. Oh, shut up. Say, tell me how you really felt about that game. The field goal, the kicker missed the kick. Talk about how angry you are at the kicker. Don't say, like, well, it's a team effort. Then, you know, they're just saying the same things over and over again. It drives me crazy. If you did a sports show, yeah, who would you want on? Because you've had athletes on. Yeah. Mike but Tyson would be the first guest because I, I've interviewed him before. He's the most forthcoming, the most fun. Um, he'll talk about anything. I love MMA guys. That's my favorite sport now uh, is MMA and UFC. Any of those guys I like. Uh, they're also, they're like uh, the same guy, the guy you described before from the Steelers. They're quiet, soft-spoken, um, but, you know, they're psychopaths. So those guys I always like talking to. I had a little uh, awkward moment with Chuck Liddell. Oh, I love Chuck. What was the awkward moment? Uh, I made fun of his commercial where uh, his belly, like he was, remember he's got, like pulling cards. It's a battery. Yes. So I said he, you know, Chuck Liddell's a bad guy. Yes. So I, I'm just sort of saying he didn't look like that you know, typical guy who's cut with the abs and the right. whole bit. <laughs> I think he basically said, if I see you, I will kill you. Is, yeah. Is what he was saying when we tried. <laughs> These guys tracked him down and then had Chuck on. He says, you know, I uh, hear you, you're saying some bad things about me. Could Chuck kill me in 10 seconds? 
Yeah, I think so. I think if he not kill you in ten seconds, he could he could do it and have eight seconds left over to relax. <laughs> Liddell is the guy. We were talking one time. I had dinner with him originally, and, and he I, we were talking about fighting. And he does he never fights in public. And he said, if I hit a guy in a bar, I'm actually disappointed if they don't have to take him to the hospital. Like that's the way he looks at fighting. He doesn't look at it like, am I going to win or lose? He looks at it like, how hurt is this going to be? Guy going to be the first time I hit him? And it's not the thing to say to a guy like Liddell, like, wow, you fight pretty good for a fat man. Yeah, you yeah. know, like Tommy Lee Jones yeah. when he was playing Cobb, Babe Ruth. You have anything I say about Babe Ruth? Ran pretty good for a fat man. <laughs> so I, I think that a guy like Liddell, his stomach is tough though. It's not fat. It's one of those weird abs, probably from doing a lot of weight in the abs. Where the stomach I think it's comes one out. Big, it's one big ab. It's yeah. just a solid rock. But ab. yeah, you're right. It doesn't look cut. But do I mean, you do impersonations? I do not. Most comedians do, though, don't they? Some do. I don't have the talent to, and I know I don't. Why? Which, which impersonations were you told I do? I do Quincy, but nobody wants to hear Quincy. <laughs> I only do one word. <laughs> Murder. That's my Quincy. I mean, that's usually one that brings the house and down. And you're killing it. There's a lot of people going, man, I, I'd like to have a nice Jack Klugman in person. Nobody does Jack Klugman anymore. Uh, Sam and Detective Monahan, I'm still working on, but my Quincy is spot on. You have cornered the market on that. I certainly have. No one else does it. Uh, he's Jim Norton. He's got a special and uh, premieres tonight at 10 Eastern on Epics. It's uh, contextually inadequate. From the uh, Somerville Theater in Boston, premieres tonight at 10 Eastern. Great to see you. Thank you very much, Thanks man. Thanks for stopping by. I appreciate it. He's uh, Jim Norton.